Just to give a heads up, we will be talking about police terrorism and police killings in this episode. In the summer of 2020, protests against white supremacy and police terrorism broke out across the country after George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Sean Reed, and countless of others were killed by the hands of police officers and white supremacists. It's a shame that it took so long for the call to defund and abolish the police to hit mainstream media. Revolutionaries been organizing around this. Yeah, bruh, the fight to abolish the police and the movement for black lives didn't just start from these protests. We can't forget about what popped off in Ferguson after Michael Brown was killed by a police officer in 2014. Tempers flare on the streets of Ferguson for a second night of unrest over the death of Michael Brown. Police in riot gear, facing off with protesters. And a lot of people probably don't know, but there's another case that also inspired the Black Lives Matter movement today. It was the killing in 2009 of a 22-year-old black man right here in Oakland. And his name was Oscar Grant. I'm Abbas Muntakeem. And I'm Delancey Parhan. And this is Tales of the Town, a podcast about black Oakland. It was early New Year's Day in 2009. Oscar and his partners took BART to celebrate New Year's Eve in the city, also known as San Francisco. For those who aren't familiar with what BART is, it's the equivalent to what the subway is to New York City. It's the Bay Area's train system. Five car train for Richmond in four minutes. Eight car train for Dublin Pleasanton in 10 minutes. Ten and on their way home, BART pigs, they pulled Oscar and his friends off of the train and onto the BART platform. So that night, I can remember I was at home. For whatever reason, Oscar really became heavy on my spirit. You know, I'm at home just relaxing and just enjoying the evening. Or actually, it's early morning now. It's after 12 o'clock. You know, it's New Year's Day, first day of the New Year's, early morning. And I'm feeling Oscar in my spirit, and I'm not sure why, but the urge to text him was so powerful that I texted him, and I texted him exactly at 1240. I'll never forget it. That's Uncle Bobby. He's known today in the town as the people's uncle. Oscar Grant was his nephew. And I said in the text, Uncle love you, God loves you, and God loves your family. Sent the text. You know, didn't think much of it after that. Of course, an hour and a half later, he was murdered on that bark platform by Johannes Mezzanine. News of Oscar's murder shook up Oakland. Bart was crowded that night because of New Year's Eve, and many witnessed Oscar Grant being killed by a white Bart police officer, Johannes Meserly. According to Meserly's so-called testimony, he apparently thought he was reaching for his taser, but instead pulled out his gun. For Uncle Bobby and other members of Oscar's family, his death would change the course of their lives forever. I can remember collapsing in extreme anger and pain and hurt. My relationship with Oscar, you know, goes back to when he was born. Uncle Bobby says he and Oscar spent a lot of time together. He remembers Oscar at just five years old, attending church with him every Sunday. And in front of sometimes 2,000 people, Oscar, without any fear, would open up the church in prayer. Basically every Sunday, 15 to 2,000 people in the church and Oscar would open up the church in prayer. And we're talking about five years old, six years old, you know, um, doing this consistently. Oscar had this infectious smile. You know, if he smiled, boy, you couldn't help but smile because that smile was just so smiley, right? And so I would drive fast and he would smile and it would make me feel good, right? So I would drive a little faster and he would smile even bigger. He just loved it. He was a chess player. 
you know, he loved playing chess and he was always determined to beat his uncle. We played a many of games. And Uncle Bobby remembers just how much love Oscar's community had for him. People loved him. You know, he was the center of attraction. He had friends from all walks of life. You know, you could see his life on that platform because there were Samoans on the platform. There was Latinos on the platform. There was black folks on the platform. There was Filipinos on the platform that was all with him in his group. And they all hung out and loved each other and just had a great time. So he was that person that brought people together. At the time Oscar was killed, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube were just starting to blow up. And news going viral through social media wasn't common. But when Karina Vargas pulled out her cell phone on the bar platform and filmed Oscar Grant getting shot in his back with his hands behind his back and later uploaded the recording to YouTube, Uncle Bobby said, this changed everything. You know, because we we had always been saying police violence is real. But for the first time, you know, in the 21st century, the, the cell phone videos played center role in what revealed to us just how heinous police violence can be. A video of the killing that was uploaded was averaging 1,000 views an hour, and it quickly hit the news cycles. Two new videos surfaced today in the shooting death of a young man New Year's Day at an East Bay BART station by a BART police officer. Now at noon, the mother of a man shot and killed by BART police is speaking out about newly released documents into... Images in the video recording of Oscar circulated all over the country, and it became one of the first cases of a police killing documented on social media that had national, if not global, impact. After the video spread across the Bay Area within hours of the shooting, people took to the streets. One of those people was Pendarvis Harshaw. Penn is a journalist who was born and raised in the town, and he was 21 at the time when Oscar was killed. Penn was tweeting what was happening in the streets of Oakland in response to Oscar's death, which not even major news outlets were doing at the time. I remember one of the earlier protests, and I'm on the street tweeting about it, and and I got a tweet from a friend saying, man, I, thank you for doing this work. Like, you're giving me more on-the-ground information than CNN is. And sure enough, like, look at what CNN was doing. They're covering it from a helicopter. And so, like, metaphorically speaking, like, I am on the ground, but also physically, I am on the ground, like, just telling you how it is as a walking human being, living in this and also reporting on it. As news was circulating around, Penn, a young black student in his junior year of college, became a direct source for the people. But not even he could predict the magnitude of the moment he was part of. And what stood out about the Oscar Grant situation is how people organized and mobilized around his name. And without that, there's questions as if justice of any sort would have ever been brought forth. One of the people organizing in the town was Dorica Blackman, who moved to Oakland from Detroit about 20 years ago. Dorica, who started organizing in college, remembers vividly what happened on the ground after Oscar's murder. The first night after the Fruitvale Station rally, people started, you know, busting windows out cars, setting things on fire. And somebody called me and said, you have to make a statement condemning that kind of action. And I did. And for valid reasons, a lot of people didn't rock with her statement. It was reactionary and it discredited the righteous rebellions of people in the street. And that hit me really, really hard. But that's what Oakland is like. It's not about your politics and your posturing. You will get checked by just about anybody in the Bay on anything because it's grassroots here. And personally, I respect Dorica for acknowledging this fault. Oftentimes you get folks taking action from a place of good intention, but they don't realize they're doing more harm than good. And in Oakland, you're going to have the OGs ready to let you know when you're wrong, and you got to be willing to acknowledge that and move differently. So 
so help you God. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. President. 19 days after Oscar Grant was killed, the U.S. swore in Barack Obama. And with this moment, what came with it was the white liberal facade of a post-racial America. It gave us the illusion of inclusion. And in reality, like presidents before him, Obama continued the neoliberal tradition and imperialist rule. So we had this, this conflict going on where Black people were so happy and drunk with joy that America had finally gotten past racism and we had selected a Black man to represent this country. And yet we had Oscar, Adolph Grimes, and Robbie Tolan, all three young Black men, all shot within a 12-hour time period on New Year's Day, all shot in the back. Oscar dies, Adolph Grimes dies, Robbie Tolan lives. And no one seemed to really have focused in on how these shootings took place because a Black man was now sworn in as the President of the United States. And now it's time for a segment on the show we call Let Me Put You On Something. Put me on some. Black folks were manipulated by Barack Obama becoming the president. I know I was when I was younger. Obama's election, it triggered the emotions of black people. And that was done purposely so that the violence that Obama was responsible for could be swept under the rug. Whether it be all the bombs he dropped or the fact that during his tenure as president, he strengthened the U.S. empire and was adamantly pro-police, doing things like writing letters in which he openly states his allegiance with police efforts. Obama represented pseudo-progress. It gave us false hope. In reality, Our people were being killed by the police all throughout his presidency. According to a study done by the Washington Post, from 2015 to 2017, while Obama was still in office, 2,935 people were killed by the police. Of those killings, black people made up about 24% of the deaths. According to a Henry A. Wallace police crime database study, since 2005, at least 140 officers have been arrested on murder and manslaughter charges and only seven officers have been convicted of murder. Roughly 98% of the killings by police officers between 2013 and 2020 have not resulted in officers being charged with a crime. And even though we had black folks in positions of power during Obama's presidency, the masses of our people failed to get justice. I think about the death of Freddie Gray. There was a black president, black head of Department of Homeland Security, black mayor, black DA, and black cops. And the result? Freddie Gray was killed by pigs who the federal government declined to prosecute. And Obama, he went on to call protesters in the streets of Baltimore thugs. And many people during Trump's presidency said let's go back to the Obama years, as if the conditions that led to the starting of the Black Lives Matter movement wasn't during Obama's presidency. Under the leadership of a black president, you had the masses of black people in America making the plea that their lives matter. Just a quick moment. Don't forget that the Tales of the Town album is out now. Make sure you go and stream. All proceeds from the music go towards supporting people's programs. Here's a snippet of Black Jacobins by Fully, J Styling, and Karan Streets. We might just drop him like an ounce, we out at Papa Shells. Black Panther, I'm Ryan Cooler, mixed with Bobby Shell. Running laps around these niggas, got my leg cramping. As a caddy, young nigga, I feel like Fred Hampton. Triple nine across my chest, I got my neck dancing. Slid on him, trying to slide, we caught him red handed. Roll up with that barrel, roll his lobster, roll my body on no Negro, fuck a Mexican, Geronimo. They know this Philly tight and ain't no optimal. I'm tripping by my seat like Rosa Parks, I blow all kind of small. Now let's get back to the story. Two years after his death, 
the movement for justice for Oscar Grant was continuing to build. There were meetings in Oakland, in Berkeley, in Hayward, and all over the Bay Area, strategizing on how to get justice for Oscar's family and the community. Here's Uncle Bobby again. You know, I would go to as many meetings as I possibly can and could because there was some meetings that were talking about tactics that, you know, we as a family didn't, you know, necessarily agree with. And then there was meetings that was talking about tactics that we agreed with. You know, the Bay Area community definitely embraced us as a family. They stood with us. They prayed for us. They cried with us. In 2010, a year after Johannes Mejerly shot Oscar Grant, Mejerly was tried for second-degree murder. The trial was moved to L.A., and according to Uncle Bobby, this was an attempt to keep the Oakland community away from the hearings. But Oakland, as we always do, showed up for our own. Uncle Bobby tells us what it was like inside the courtroom. You know, our first day in court, Judge Robert Perry told us that if we don't make that L.A. crowd outside go away, he'll make our case last five, seven, 10, 15 years or longer until they all go away because he stated he wasn't intimidated by the crowd. But at the same time, we weren't going to go out and tell the crowd to leave. And so we didn't. So, of course, he tried to admonish us for that. But, you know, you can do what you want. It's not our responsibility to tell the crowd to go home. What's even worse, bruh, is that the trial only got uglier from there. The judge said Oscar was resisting arrest, even though eyewitnesses saw Oscar laying face down with his hands behind his back. Uncle Bobby also recounts the racist things the judge said. And of course, on the very last day of the trial, he looked at us and said, I don't know why you keep trying to make this about black and white. My God, we just gave you a black president. You know, and so these are the statements and the experiences that we as a family had to endure while we was in that courtroom dealing with the trial for Oscar's murder. In the end, Johannes Mejerly was convicted of involuntary manslaughter and only ended up serving 11 months in county jail. It was the first time in California state history that an officer was arrested, charged, convicted, and sent to jail. We tap back in with Dorika Blackman, who we heard from earlier. She reflects on the significance of the movement for Oscar Grant. Oscar is just one of many examples that we can all name of Black people that were killed by the police for no reason. And I think, if anything, he was a symbol of the use of technology to capture that story. Part of what Oscar represents as a symbol was that moment when people even outside of our community were like, nah, like we saw what happened and we got the video to prove it. But for Oscar's family and his community, this wasn't really a victory. It hit Dorika the hardest when she heard Wanda Johnson, Oscar Grant's mother, react to her son's death. I think it was her story of him the most that touched me because she wasn't in it for the movement, right? She lost her kid. And at one point we were talking about justice and she was like, what is justice? Right? Like, it's not going to bring my son. None of this is going to bring my son back. After the verdict was called, protests popped off across the Bay Area and California. People was hella angry, and the chant, I am Oscar Grant, echoed across Oakland. We all are Oscar Grant! We all are Oscar Grant! The whole damn system is guilty! We all are Oscar Grant! The whole damn system is guilty! And Oscar Grant, he became a cultural symbol for black liberation not only in Oakland, but across the so-called United States. 
Some years later, his story was commemorated in the feature film Fruitvale Station, directed by my cousin and Oakland filmmaker Ryan Coogler. Shots fired, Fruitvale. We just trying to get home. What is going on? Next stop, Fruitvale Station. If you remember listening back to our first episode, we interviewed my great granny Charlene. And Ryan actually ended up filming most of Fruitvale Station in her house. And at the time, it was the biggest set I'd ever been on in my life. And I'm shooting on my block, like down the street from my grandma's house. Yeah. And I'll never forget, like, 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 like I'm, I'm on my way to, to work. The AD driving me, like, hey, we're going to go to base camp first. And I'm like, what's base camp? Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And, and then, <laughs> and then he like, he like, well, that's when we're going to park the car. So he parked the yeah. car, and we get another car. And I'm like, no, why are we getting in this car? <laughs> and I'm, down the, I'm down the street, man. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know, I know this never like the back of my hand. Yeah. Bro, like, stop putting me in these cars. You feel me? And then, I mean, you know, now, or, or, you know, it's, 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 it's Penn right. remembers what it was like to watch Fruitvale Station when it opened up in Oakland at the Grand Lake Theater. I end up getting a seat that's one or two rows behind Oscar Grant's family. There's a couple of scenes in that film, man, that are just just gut-wrenching, just in general. But I just, you know, couldn't hold back. Grand Lake Theater has seen me shed a few tears, but that was one of the more powerful experiences. Oscar Grant means so much to Oscar's family, but also to the people of Oakland. I'm so deep in the weeds now of writing about the criminal justice system. Every so often I look up and I'm like, where, how did I even get started on this? And it's literally Oscar Grant. I could see myself in somebody who the system had failed. And when I saw that, I wanted to write about Oscar Grant because I felt like that could be me. Penn says that the murder of Oscar Grant is how he got started in journalism. Little did Penn know, when I was in high school, I was reading his coverage of the case. He even put together an album with rapper Young Gully, where Penn narrated what happened to Oscar. What a lifeless road, I live where the nice is cold. Since Oscar died, the whole city been in crisis mode. So many lies are told, but it's not surprising, no. We're still out despising, so how can we survive and grow? When they throw us in cuffs, another life is taken. Another cop that's off the hook, another mama pacing. Another shirt made, seems like it never stops. The town ain't really been the same since LaBelle was shot. Huh. I just want for my people to shine. But sometimes I get the feeling my people are blind to see what they want to see. But we got to take a stand. How can I really Respect a cop or even shake his hand When they so against us, it's like calling a snake a friend Giving policemen immunities, what you rate a plan? Shit is crazy, and it just amazed me How we get treated, but I never let the system break Yeah, let's do it for Oscar, let's do it for Oscar Pull the biggest bottle out, let's do it for Oscar Put your lighters in This album definitely helped shape my mind As a young black high schooler at the time And Oscar's death, it woke me up to the reality Of what it meant to be a black man in the U.S., This is similar to how the culture of music was shifting in the black power movement. As consciousness in the streets was rising due to the killing of Oscar Grant, Young Goey's music shifted to tell the story of the time. And for Penn, it was an opportunity for him to contribute more to the cause. To a lot of people of my generation, that was the first example that we saw of documented evidence that police do brutalize people. Do I think that's true for all people? No. I think there are some people who've experienced it in their personal lives or maybe have experienced uh, other stories. There's so many cases that have happened since then and before then that have catalyzed people. But I think for a large swath of people, that Oscar Grant video changed their lives. And it's still mind-blowing to me to, like, listen to a Big Crit album and he mentioned Oscar Grant. And I'm like, oh, dang, all the way down to an artist from Mississippi? Okay. And for Uncle Bobby, the death of his nephew is what pushed him to organize. And I remembered how blessed I was to have text Oscar before he was murdered. And it was from there that I realized that my anger wasn't to be acted upon in a destructive way, but my anger was to be acted upon in a constructive way about getting justice for Oscar. 
when the community here in Oakland chanted, I am Oscar Grant, it created a movement that is carried on today throughout this nation. And Oscar's family has continued to be a part of this nationwide movement. For example, Uncle Bobby ended up creating an organization called the Love Not Blood Campaign, which supports and provides resources to families who have been victims of police killings. As hundreds of people have been killed by the police since Oscar's death, it's clear that the work that Uncle Bobby and others is doing is of necessity. But we must take preventative measures so these police killings stop for good. And this is why we have to get in our communities and organize, because we must love, support, and protect each other from white supremacist violence. On the next episode of Tales of the Town, the fight to get police out of Oakland Unified School District. Our ultimate goal is to successfully implement police-free schools and then also be a blueprint for everybody in the nation and possibly internationally to do the same thing and to not silo this work to just Oakland, but to really be able to impact our school system and how we educate everywhere. That's next week on Tales of the Town. Tales of the Town is hosted and executive produced by me, Delincey Parhan, and Abbas Mutakin. Our senior producer is Maya Cueva. Fact-checking done by Danya Suleiman and Bashir Mack. Mixing and sound design is done by Pat Masidi Miller and Lauren Newsom. The theme song was produced by Cheyenne G and Carrie Lynn. The artists featured from the Tales of the Town album on this episode are Fully, Jay Stylin, and Karan Streets. Special thanks to Pendarvis Harshaw and Dorika Blackman. We also want to give a special thank you to Uncle Bobby and the Oscar Grant family. Be sure to support the Love Not Blood campaign. If you like this show, please be sure to subscribe, give us that five-star review, and tell your friends. 